there, guys. This is Rita. This is Amanda. And you're listening to I Don't, I Don't Know, Know Her, Her, the podcast where we talk about women you've probably never heard of, but you should have. And you will. How are you doing, Rita? I had, it's a, a rainy Sunday today. Mm-hmm. Um, it's been a long week. Uh, did a little football with the kiddo today. Lost terribly. It was, it's painful. What was the score? <laughs> it was 40 to nothing. Yeah. So hard. And I was like, keep your chin up. <laughs> we were talking about it. I was I was uh, finishing up our weekend meal prep when Rita arrived. And so we were talking about that. And I was like, there's really nothing you can say. No. <laughs> it's just, hey, that sucks. I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah. But he does have a treat waiting for him at home. He uh, got to pick out, he loves himself a bath bomb. So he got himself a bath bomb. So it's grape soda. <laughs> I didn't even know they made grape soda bath bombs. Apparently. That's <laughs> actually great. His first one was a glitter unicorn one, and he absolutely loved it. Was the bath water glittery? Uh, yeah, it was glittery and oh, pink, and it was God. amazing. So no, If he, I were into baths, that would be what I would want. He's And he likes a good soak after football, too. Does so. he get glitter on him when he's in them like Oh, that? yeah. It was like a stripper <laughs> blew up in my bathroom. <laughs> I, so last night, I went to a fundraiser for our local LGBTQ youth organization, which I am currently the vice chair of the board of. So it was kind of like a requirement that I go. But I like going anyway, because I like to have a reason to get into a costume. And all I wanted was body glitter. <laughs> all I wa- the theme this year was space, like outer space. And so I went as like this sexy space girl, which I'm usually not into that kind of stuff. I like more clever costumes. But this week was not the week for me to try to fit in shopping. So <laughs> I just was like, Amazon. <laughs> <laughs> you bought it online? That thing fit you perfectly. Uh, I would say the top needed some work. <laughs> Everyone who saw my pictures commented about my boobs, which is the sign that your dress is a little too exposing. (laughs) (laughs) So I wish that I had put some safety pins on the sides because what was happening is the it's supposed to have a little cleavage showing like a little window, but it's they're separate. The top and the section were separate, but I wish that they had been clipped like right where my armpits are. Okay, And that way it would have stayed at least covering my bra. (laughs) It was, yeah. <laughs> anyway, I really wanted I was okay body, glitter. <laughs> body glitter. Body <laughs> glitter. Because I thought that would just enhance the space look, like stardust, you know? You remember how much fun glitter was, too? I think yes. we've talked about glitter like three or four times. <laughs> body glitter was such a thing when we were in middle school and high school. Yeah. And I like that it's made a comeback. <laughs> For homecoming my senior year, I had body glitter in a spray can. And I just sprayed it all over myself. I was like, I look like the stars. <laughs> I had um, gel body glitter Mm -hmm. that was um, scented. Oh, it was Calvin Klein CK one. Ooh, remember CK one? Fancy shit. Yeah, that was yeah. Everybody wanted CK one. It was it was the tiniest, tiniest little tub of it, and so I used it so sparingly. (laughs) I would only put it on my chest and my cheekbones. Oh my gosh! (laughs) Wow. And it lasted until college. So. That tells you how long I how hung on to that trend. Body gel. <laughs> I used to. I used to also. I would put it in my hair sometimes. Or like I used put to it do on my that. fingertips and like pull it through my hair. But um, it was like not meant for hair. So then I would just have these like glittery, oily strands <laughs> that stuck straight out. <laughs> I made good choices. Oh, the experimentation. Yes. <laughs> I don't even know what we were talking about at this point. <laughs> We were talking, well, we talked about bath bomb, which led to glitter, which led to our childhood and reminiscing. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. Anyway, I've spent most of my week not doing a whole lot because I have been in a lot of pain. Mm -hmm. So I think I mentioned right at the end of our first season, we talked a little bit about what was going on with me health wise Mm -hmm. um, and that I was still sort of searching for answers. And we're getting closer. We're still not completely at answer like destination, but we're getting closer. I do have a rheumatologist now and I have a neurologist and my rheumatologist told me that I probably have this one specific type of arthritis that's in the sort of autoimmune family called um, spondyloarthritis or spondylitis. And uh, the most common one is called ankylosing, which is where like parts of your spine start to fuse. Mm. And so... But for the most part, it's like a pretty manageable arthritis. You take like some NSAIDs, like 
prescription strength ibuprofen type stuff and it's pretty manageable especially if you stay active which i am a pretty active person or i like to be so it really was an odd situation the other night it was well over a week ago it was like friday night i had um taken the dog for a walk during the day felt fine and we had decided to stay home we're watching tv and i was sitting on the couch and i went to get up from the couch at the end of the evening and something in my left hip just stuck and it was excruciating pain. It felt like I had like a Charlie horse, but Mm. in my hip. And I was like, Oh man, that was weird. And I like rolled it with a, you know, a ball and I was stretching and pulling and stretching and rolling and finally got it to loosen up. And I was like, well, that was weird. And I went to bed, felt fine the next day. And then the same thing happened the next night, only it didn't go away. No matter what I tried to do, massaging, rolling, I was doing everything I possibly could. I went to work on Monday and I was in a ton of pain all day. I left work early on Tuesday because I was still in pain. It was getting progressively worse. Left Tuesday because I already had a neurology appointment that afternoon. And Mm -hmm. I was like, you know what? I'm just going to go in to the clinic beforehand and have this looked at. By the time I was making it there, I was I was screaming in the car, like by myself down the highway screaming because it was in so much pain. Like Jeez. sitting was the most uh, uncomfortable thing to do. And I had an hour long wait to get in and I couldn't sit down and standing sucked too. And everything I did was just super painful. Mm. So I was like awkwardly standing, sitting, groaning, moaning in the middle of like a public waiting room, which felt really weird. It it made me feel like I was one of those like scary people at the clinic. <laughs> oh, <laughs> that you're like sitting there like, oh my god, what are <laughs> they don't, on? Don't have a knife, please. And uh, I get in to see this PA because it's a walk-in clinic, and I've never met this person before. And they've they've looked over my chart and saw that my rheumatologist said I had this arthritis. Mm-hmm. She was like, well, it could be a flare-up of that. And I was like, it doesn't feel like that because I've had this this pain for a long time, the pain that got me diagnosed with this arthritis. Yeah. This was totally something I've never experienced before. And she was like, okay, well I think it's sciatica and here is this prescription for hydrocodone and some steroids. Have a good day. Is that legal? (laughs) I don't know. She didn't even touch me. Like didn't have me get undressed. Didn't take a look at my hip. Didn't, didn't root around to figure out if there was something catching or something going on and I've had sciatica before it's a very specific pain and usually you really feel it in the back of your leg Mm -hmm. no I've got no pain in the back of my leg nothing like that so I ended up being on a pretty heavy dose of prednisone which is a a steroid and then I also got put on hydrocodone for pain and I have to I had to stop taking my regular arthritis medication because it doesn't go well with the steroid And I have lidocaine patches that I put on and it still was not really doing much for me. I ended up like in a ton of pain again on Thursday. Like the whole week was just me being in pain and trying to find a way to manage it. And like literally the only way I could sit or whatever was I had to be flat on my back and I could put a pillow behind my head. And that was the most amount I could sit up. Wow. Because if I had... If I tilted my hips in any way in an angle that headed towards 90 degrees, I was immediately in pain. So I couldn't sit. I feel too just the dismissiveness of people who need help with pain management Mm. because the system has been abused, but it doesn't mean that everybody's doing that. And so just like, here, I want to throw some pills at you. It's kind of that's I'm not okay with that. Well, when I when she said sciatica, I kind of like looked at her and I think I made a noise and she was like, what, you disagree? Kind of. Yeah. And I was I like, well, I've had it before and it didn't didn't feel like this. She was like, well, you have it worse this time. <laughs> Whoa. Yeah. I was like, or I don't have that. Could be that. Could be possible since you don't even really know. You said you just think. <laughs> well, and she didn't touch me. Like I event, I, I was like sort of staring at her like, what are you doing? And she... She, like, put her hands on my hips, and she was like, yeah, I think it's sciatica. Like, I'm still fully clothed. I had a, I had heavy jeans on and a sweatshirt, and she was trying to touch my hips through those layers. I was like, you can't feel anything. It was really frustrating, and 
like then the meds were all, you know, I mean, the, anytime you start a really heavy duty med like that and mm-hmm. you, there, you're not used to it. So I was like having the shakes and nausea and hot flashes. <laughs> I felt like I was going through menopause. <laughs> Maybe you got a glimpse. <laughs> yeah, I know. I got a little glimpse, a little window into what that's going to be like. Hell. <laughs> oh, shit. Oh, that is so frustrating. It is. And I'm still um, in pain and my steroid ends tomorrow. So she was like, well, if, the ster- if that doesn't work, come back in. I was like, yeah, not to you. No, yeah. <laughs> I'll visit someone else. Thank you very When's much. When's your day off? <laughs> so, you know, fingers crossed. I do feel better. I will say that. Like, Good. I, I really rested most of the weekend. I had that thing I went to yesterday. Mm. Um, so that was, that was a, a lot more action than I've had most of the week. Yeah. Um, but today I cooked, as you know, and I did my writing and I read a book. Like that's all I've done today to try mm-hmm. to like manage it and keep it sort of calm. Yeah. And I think maybe part of it is going to be just my rheumatologist my rheumatologist was like you need to start meditating. What? <laughs> yeah. Um yeah. Okay, are you going to try? <laughs> I've tried before. It's real hard. Meditating is hard. It's so a lot hard. of people think it's um like going blank. But it's more, I feel like, serious, like, focus on mm-hmm. something, not just letting your mind go empty. And you can't let your mind go empty. Yeah. And it makes you suddenly so aware of, like, what a chipmunk brain you, chipmunk <laughs> brain you have. Like, you just are, like, constantly thinking about something. Yeah. And you're, like, ping-ponging around. Yeah. So I have to work on mindfulness, <laughs> which is not the first time I've had a doctor tell me to work on mindfulness. <laughs> <laughs> but um, I do think that that will help because it does like when you're in pain or whatever, you have a tendency to tense up everything. Mm, yeah. And you're being right. able to like relax and let that go can help ease that inflammation and calm it down. So I know that that's a real thing. I'm not poo pooing it. I know it's real, but it's, it's hard. hard. And it's not something I have a tendency to prioritize. Like you have to yeah. make it part of your schedule. Yeah, it's not like, well, oh, okay, I'm going to go run my errands really quick and do laundry. And oh, yeah, don't forget to meditate. It's like, <laughs> I've got shit to do. Yes. <laughs> yeah. And they say like the best time to do it is like right when you wake up. So mm, true. <sighs> all right. Fingers crossed for you, too. If you do it, I'll do it. I don't want to do it with someone <laughs> Okay. I've just opened my eye. I would just end up like staring at you while you do it weirdly. <laughs> Not at the same time. <laughs> we just check in oh, with each other. Oh, I thought you meant together. <laughs> I was like, no. Yes, every morning I want you to come to my house at 6 a.m. and we will meditate together. We do live 10 blocks away from each other. It's so true. there's that. <laughs> we could. We really could do that. Okay. I'll okay. Get on that. <laughs> Let's get on our ladies today. Not on them. I mean, God, my mind today. Your mind today. She was checking out my wife. She had a fucking workman's belt on. She I had a can, tool belt on. Mm-hmm. Looking ain't touching. Did you go first last week or did I? Um, last I think I went. Week, I went. You ended. Sec- we I went ended second. On a high note. You went second. Yeah. Do we think we could switch it up and I'll go first today? Absolutely. Okay. All right, Amanda. Who do you have today? Okay, so he, just as a forewarning, I took two years of Spanish in college, <laughs> and um. Not very good at it. <laughs> I have this desire to eventually speak fluent Spanish, but... So do I. <laughs> so today my person is a Spanish woman, and I'm going to do my damnedest to pronounce these things correctly. Please help me. Okay. <laughs> if you hear something and you're like, girl. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay, I'm going to talk about Lucia Sanchez Sarnil. Whoa, I don't know her. Yay. I didn't know her either. <laughs> her name, uh, well, she's a lesbian poet, a feminist thinker, and an anarchist in the Spanish Civil War. Whoa, okay. I know, she's fun and spicy. <laughs> Lucia was born December 13th, 1895 in Madrid, Spain. Not much is known about her early life, except that her mother died when she was young. And she was raised by her widowed father, and they were very, very poor. So that's literally it. Oh, wow. <laughs> However, okay. Lucia was already known for being really in- extremely intelligent, and she was actually asked to attend the Royal Academy of Fine Arts of San Fernando as a poet. Wow. 
So I, I was like, well, cool. It just sounds like a school to me. So I looked up the school. This academy is no longer a school anymore. Now it's a museum and a gallery. It was built during the Enlightenment period in Spain, and it's known for having housed and educated some of Spain's most influential artists and thinkers, like Francisco Goya, Picasso, Salvador Dali, Oscar de la Renta. We know those names. Yeah. Yeah. So she was asked to attend this program. Wow. So it says a lot about how intelligent she must have been. Yeah. And how talented, because those are people who changed the world. Mm Mm-hmm. Um, she was also from an impoverished background and that also was sort of incongruous with the kind of people who ended up getting to go to the Royal Academy because there was such a very extreme classist system set up in Spain, Yeah, which is going to come into play later. So when you say Royal school, was it, uh, was it a school that was made by, by royalty in Spain? Cause didn't they have a... Yeah. During the enlightenment period. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Lucia identified as a lesbian, or at least with lesbian ideas, very early on. She began having her poetry published as early as 1919, so she was in her early 20s then. Many of her works contained lesbian themes. However, homosexuality was a crime in Spain then, which meant that she would be censored, or worse, sent to jail. Yeah. So she actually wrote her poetry under a male pen name which allowed her to explore explore her queerness without fear of being discovered or jailed. Yeah. And her poetry was, people loved her poetry. It was getting published all in these like really like, you know, journals where really well-known poets were being published, but she was doing so under another name. Yeah. Which she is, had to. Sucks. Yeah. I did. I was trying to find some of her poetry just to like read it for myself. Um, and I found a couple of them, but it's been basically, I think, lost to the oh, ages. No. Um, even like, I think I found like two or three of them written in Spanish that hadn't been translated to English, but for the most part, they're just gone. Mm. So at the same time as she's rising in the ranks in the poetry world, she's becoming really disillusioned by the stark de- class differences in Spain. She is not alone in this. This is a period of great unrest in Spain. Spain is seeing this rise in disaffected lower classes who are being oppressed by the ones who are in charge, who are all of upper class. And the lower class people are accusing the upper class people of hoarding their wealth and keeping workers underpaid and overworked. Hmm. A pretty classic story that we've heard before. So there was this growing movement in Spain to unite workers in unions and at the same time as there's this unionization movement, there is a political movement that sort of is like parallel and mm-hmm. sort of hand in hand. And it is an anarchist political movement. Mm-hmm. One of the things that I learned about this anarchist movement, because when I think of anarchy, I think of like, oh, no one's in charge. Mm-hmm. And that's sort of what they were um, after. That's a really simplified idea of it. But what they really believed is that if there was no hierarchy, then there would be no inequality. Mm -hmm. So we're going to talk about that in a minute, too. So even though Lucia was well-known as a poet, at least under her her pen name, she did not make money from that. So she had to have a real job, and she worked as a telephone operator at a state-run company called Telefonica. Classic artist tale as (laughs) well. (laughs) I don't know. I'm in a band at night, but I wait tables during the day, you know, kind of thing. Well, and especially if you weren't already born into wealth. Yeah. Like, if you had a comfy life where everything was already given to you, sure, you could explore your art and not feel in any way compromised. Yeah. But those of us who have backgrounds where that's not the case, we have to work and do our art and find a way to balance that. Mm -hmm. So she works at this company called Telefonica, and in 1931, the Anarchist Labor Union, Confederación Nacional del Trabajo, otherwise known as CNT, organized a strike against Telefonica, which Lucia participated in. And this became a huge turning point for her. This was the moment when she realized, this is what I want to do. Hmm. I want to be an activist. And she was especially drawn to the social revolution that was happening at the time to try to undo the centuries of classism Mm -hmm. in Spain. 
And CNT is going to come up a couple of times, so just keep that in mind. It's, again, Confederación Nacional del Trabajo, or the National Confederation of Workers Yeah, in English. I think trabajo means to work, doesn't it? Yes. Yeah. Lucia went all in on anarchist unionized, as, <laughs> unionized activism. She was like... She went... <laughs> All in. <laughs> yeah, she just dove right in. She was like, well, this is what I want to do, so I'm going to throw everything at it. <laughs> so she joined the CNT and became the writing secretary for the organization out of Madrid in 1933. And she would create a journal that would go out to all of the workers like every month. Mm-hmm. And she would write the whole thing. Almost like a newsletter in a way. Mm-hmm. Okay. But it was more than just a newsletter because it would collect all kinds of articles and stuff. So she was an editor, but she wrote a lot of stuff in there. And she did this all the way through up until the Spanish Civil War. Wow. And she was not content with just writing about the social movement. She felt it was her duty to include her feminist ideals in her writings for the CNT. So she had very, very specific ideas about feminism, about equality, about gender, gender roles. And she would write about them in this magazine that was primarily the unionized workers were men. So she had this rare opportunity to be a voice speaking to men in the organization. Mm -hmm. And women had been largely ignored. So it was kind of cool that she did that. Yeah. So in addition to writing about feminism in that magazine, she also had her work included in some anarchist publications outside of that. Um, Here, there's one of them called Earth and Freedom, The White Magazine, and Workers' Solidarity. Was her work well-received? That's hard to tell. Yeah. um, Because in one of the things that I read was an actual translation of something she had read or written in the magazine. She talked about being at things with people in the union and in the movements, and they would... It it would be as if, you know how you've been in this situation where people think like you're the exception of your group. And so they'll say stuff that they would not normally say around another woman or another woman of color or whatever. Mm -hmm. And then they'll say that thing and they're like, well, you're not like that. You're one of the good ones. You're one of the good ones. Yeah. Yeah. And so she would have that happen to her a lot. Like she would be with these guys and the guys would say like really stupid shit about how, you know, women are too emotional to be in this group. And she's like, what am I? (laughs) But they're like, oh, but you're cool. Yeah. Like one of them, there was this woman who had walked through like the conference room they were in. And the guy turns to her and he says something like, I'll I'll catch her later. Like I'll grab her later. And she was like, that's all you see? Like she's in the union too. She's a worker too. But you see her as a sexual object. Yeah. And if you're truly fighting for this Mm -hmm. concept... It needs to go further. And I'm going to talk a little bit about actually some of her specific things she talks about because one, I loved reading it. And two, she wrote this shit in the 30s, 1930s. And we're almost 100 years later. And I feel like it could have been written today. Wow. Okay. So so because she was around a long time ago, I couldn't actually get any um, documentaries. And everything I did find were like professors talking about her, but in Spanish. And I was like, none of this works. (laughs) So I'm going to take a time to read some of her actual words because I think that's important. So she was a big proponent of pointing out the hypocrisy of the movements, um, which championed this idea of egalitarianism, right? Everybody's equal. Everybody has equal footing. Um, But they still often believed in the inferiority of women. Hmm. So like equality, but for us, not only us. Only us. Yes. Yes. Women are inferior. They don't need equality. Mm hmm. So what are they going to do with it? What are they going to do with that? Exactly. Okay. <laughs> Fuck that. <laughs> she was also po- interested in pointing out that Spanish men especially believe that women served one purpose and that was to be mothers. Mm-hmm. And in fact, there was like a really big thinker and leader of this social revolution who wrote all of this, like all of these thought pieces that everybody followed and believed wholeheartedly where he was like, Oh no, women aren't intellectually inferior. We've seen plenty of women who are really smart. They're physically inferior. Oh gosh. And that's okay because that physical inferiority is what makes them mothers and motherhood is the best thing in the world. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I love 
love the tone of that. We're still supportive, but yeah. it's like it's like that. What is that saying? That s- slam you with a smile kind of thing. Oh, so she okay. takes that idea to task, and I we're going to talk a little bit about this this dichotomy that she creates because I think it's really smart. So women at this time, just FYI as a background, women were still forced into marriage in Spain at this point, and single women were required to have a chaperone when they went out in public. Okay. They also only received half of the income of a man in any similar position. Okay. <laughs> so it's real. It's pretty bad. It's the, in, the This inequality is substantial. Blatant, too. So with that in back, in your mind, in the background, okay, here are some of the things she wrote, which she wrote in 1936. Um, this is her talking about, like, uh, at the time, the working class were paid so low and so overworked that she was making this, like, metaphor of slavery okay. about how they're being treated by the upper class. The lowliest slave, once he steps across his threshold, becomes lord and master. His merest whim becomes a binding order for the women in his household. He who, just ten minutes earlier, had to swallow the bitter pill of bourgeois humiliation, looms like a tyrant and makes these unhappy creatures swallow the bitter pill of their supposed inferiority. Wow. Yeah, it's just yeah. pointing out the hypocrisy, right? Like, yeah. you don't want to be treated like shit. You're coming home and treating women like shit. She goes on to talk about how the pervasive theory about this, like, women aren't intellectually inferior, but their bodies are different mm-hmm. situation. And how motherhood was, like, this magical, mystical thing instead of just, like, a reality yeah. that you have. She said this. As far as the theory of differentiation is concerned... Woman is nothing more than a tyrannical uterus whose dark influences reach even into the deepest recesses of the brain. Women's whole psychic life is obedient to a biological process, and that biological process is quite simply the process of gestation. Science has tinkered with the terms about tampering with the essence of that axiom. Birth, gestation, and death. The whole and all of the womanly prospect. Hmm. She's like that. If you boil us down, that that's the only thing we have. We 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 get born, we born we're born in order to gestate, and then we die. Yeah, and we're so much more than that. Right. Yeah. Lucia also believed that these sexist ideas had a tendency to separate women, the idea of what you are as a woman, as an individual person, um, from motherhood. Mm-hmm. Basically, that if you boil a woman's entire existence down to motherhood alone, you're erasing her identity as a woman. Mm-hmm. Period. Absolutely. So that woman is the individual and motherhood ignores the individuality. It Mm -hmm. becomes like you're a a factory machine. She said this about the idea. I said that we had the notions of womanhood and of motherhood set beside each other, but I was wrong. We already have something worse. The notion of motherhood overshadowing that of womanhood, the function annihilating the individual. Woman, on the other hand, is an individual, a thoughtful creature, a higher entity. By focusing on the mother, you seek to banish woman when you could have woman and mother, because womanhood never excludes motherhood. Exactly. So if you're saying that motherhood is the only thing that is like the basis of who this person is. So if a woman can't have any children, Mm -hmm. is she non-existent? She doesn't exist. That's so true. She has no worth. Yeah. I love that she points that out at the end, though. She says, when you say that, you're saying that motherhood excludes women, you know, when you don't have to do that. Mm -hmm. Womanhood never excludes motherhood. Yeah, true. And I think that's an important thing. I mean, like, I have not given birth and you have. Mm -hmm. And I think that there is, you've talked quite a bit throughout our, the years that we've been friends about being a whole complete person. Yes. And I, I had always said from the beginning when I had my son, even when he was still a baby, I was like, just because he's here does not mean I stop existing. Mm-hmm. I would tell myself that because I'm like, I still get to have a life. And my son is definitely a huge part of that, but he's not all of that. He's not all of everything of me, you know, and my identity and who I am. There's some mothers out there, I I don't want to judge, but they just... It's their entirety. 
Yeah. But then it's like when those children go away, who are you? I you know. know. You lose pieces of who you are. I think that there's, I think that being a parent is so fucking hard. And especially those first few years when as mothers, you mm. basically can't exist separately yes. from them because yeah. they can't exist without you. Mm -hmm. And I think that that those first couple of years sort of condition you to sort of forget you exist outside of this young human. Mm -hmm. And we as a society don't do a good job of really lifting women up and sort of saying that now it's time for you to go out into the world and find yourself again. Mm -hmm. I it's I it's hard for me. I feel like this is what Lucia is getting at is that you know, she wants women to feel that they are they can be both mm -hmm. an individual and a mother. I, agree. I definitely think there should be you should be both. Cuz honestly, I feel like because I have done that, I feel like I can be a better mother that way because then I can show my son as an example of like maybe when he becomes a parent or mm -hmm. I don't know, maybe he doesn't want to be a parent, um, that he can still exist. You know, his identity will still be there, you know, father, no father. And if he becomes a partner to somebody who has a tendency to like do that whole like pull in, never seek to go out situation, he might recognize that and say, you know what, actually, I'd like you to mm -hmm. do something for you. Art, go out with friends, whatever. Yeah. Get a job. Whatever it is you want to do, do that thing. Yeah. So in 1936, Lucia becomes really frustrated and dissatisfied with the exclusionary and sexist attitudes of these movements, right? She's trying her best. She's purposely speaking to men about this problem because mm -hmm. she knows that she's preaching to the fucking choir over here with women. <laughs> yeah, they're like, oh, yeah, we know. We're aware. <laughs> so she eventually decides, fuck it. I'm going to start my own movement. <laughs> so she joins up with two fellow feminists. That reminds me of Patsy Mink. We make my own damn group. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> I love her. So she starts her own movement with two fellow feminists, Mercedes Coma Posada and Amparo Poch y Lascon, to form Mujeres Libres, or Free Women. Mm -hmm. And they did not see themselves necessarily. They wanted to be autonomous and separate, but con like parallel and lucia is still doing stuff with the male dominated movements but she's also doing this mm -hmm. and which she finds to be an incredibly important aspect of the movement itself because it's not forgetting women and of course she also rejects the notion that if you fix and becomes an anarchist political movement if it if we win that automatically everybody will be equal, including women. Mm -hmm. She's like, fuck that. Look at where we are right now. I'm in this group and I'm not equal. Yeah. And other women aren't equal. There's always work to be done. So that's why she felt the need to have Mujeres Libres. Mm -hmm. So they sought to highlight the dual struggle of both women's liberation and the social revolution. And um, at the same time that they were forming Mujeres Libres, there was a similar group started in Barcelona called Grupo Cultural Femenino, who were focused on equality within the unions. And the two groups decided to join forces and they became known as Agrupación Mujeres Libres. Nice. That same year, the Spanish Civil War began. And this, the Spanish Civil War is basically this war between the classes mm -hmm. and about how they will structure their society afterwards. And the membership in Mujeres Libres explodes. <laughs> More than 30,000 members across oh my gosh. Spain. That's a lot of fucking people. That's a lot of fucking people. Yeah. In 1937, Lucia began working as an editor for a magazine called Threshold. And as she's there, she meets a woman named America Bar Barroso. And America would become her lifelong partner. As the, as the war broke out, Mujeres Libres were ready and organized. Those bitches had that shit on lock. They were able to participate in the war fully as both revolutionaries and gun-toting militia members. Ooh. Sanchez and her team were instrumental in spreading the news and propaganda supporting their cause during the war. Mujeres Libres also organized schools that continued running throughout the war, a women's-only newspaper, women's-only social groups. They taught working-class women how to read and write. They also taught them nursing skills so they could take care of the wounded as they came back from battle. Lucia was also a proponent of teaching women sexual health. Nice. Because women were not being allowed to talk about sex or know about sex or know how birth control works. 
or postnatal care. Mm-hmm. Like, so she was doing classes on all of this stuff, her group. Because women die over mm-hmm. stuff like this. Yeah. And they were being perpetually impregnated, even if they didn't want to be, which is another form of servitude, right? Mm-hmm. You can't get out of this, the shackles of motherhood mm-hmm. if you can never stop popping babies out. Yeah. They also formed free daycare so that women could be free to work in the places that men could no longer work. And women were also educated in childhood development so they could understand what's happening to their children as they grow up. Children in schools, this was even better, the children in schools were being taught about what their mothers were fighting for so that they understood that their moms had an important purpose. Mm -hmm. And they were just mom. And also teaching other little girls that you can do that someday too. Yes. So Mujeres Libres remained autonomous from the larger CNT organization so that their accomplishments could not be overshadowed by that organization that was run by men. (laughs) They're like, no, we're all on our own. (laughs) (laughs) Nevertheless, Lucia was very well respected and also wanted to break down the barriers in that male-dominated movement. And she actually rose to become the general secretary of Solidariedad Internacional Antifascista, which was SIA. And it was an anarchist aid organization that functioned similar to the Red Cross. So she became the general secretary of that group. So at the same time, she's like the writing person for the C... I can't remember what that one is. Is it the CIT? CNA, I think. CNT. CNT. And then also at the SIA. So the Spanish Civil War has been called the dress rehearsal for World War II. Really? Yeah, because it was basically like a very similar foundation. Mm-hmm. And unfortunately, the leftist, leftist groups that were really trying hard to create this more egalitarian society were not very well connected. They were not as well organized as the ones that were being fought for the establishment. Mm-hmm. And with in months, things began to fall apart. So they lose. Oh. And they lose pretty badly. Yeah. So... Lucia and America uh, have to flee. They are now basically exiled from Spain because if they're there, they're going to be imprisoned. Yeah, or killed, probably. Yep. Yeah. So Lucia, um, you know, was very well known as an, as an anti-fascist and an anarchist. So they had to leave. They settled in Paris. So for a couple of years, things were fine in Paris. But you know what time it is, right? What happens? <laughs> Invasion? Yeah. Ah, it's fucking World War II. It's World War II. So shortly oh. after they arrive there, the Nazi fascist movement takes over fucking France. And they're France, like, hell no. And they have to flee again because it's not safe for them in France. No. They had been, when they got to France, they were doing the same work. They were still working with this SIA, the Solidariedad uh, Internacional Antifascista, which was an anti-fascist movement. Yeah. And then the fucking Nazis take over and they're like, ah, oh, shit. Yeah. So they have to leave again, and they return to Madrid sometime in 1941 or 42. And Lucia and America move in with America's family, and basically at that point they have to go into hiding. Not only is fascism on the rise across all of Europe, including Spain, making it extremely dangerous to go out in public for them, Mm -hmm. there was also this rise in Catholic moralism in Spain, which I don't... I don't think we need and to explain it. Around, well, <laughs> around that time, too, the Catholic Church in Spain ha- was all tied up in politics as well. They had political beholds over people. For sure. And in fact, there are pictures of the fucking Pope and Cardinals with Nazis. Ew. At the time. Like, just sort of going along with whatever they're doing. Yeah. They're considered one of the biggest... Um, like bystanders, because yeah, they just didn't just, do anything. They didn't do anything. As, as an organization, mm-hmm. individual Catholic parishes and things like that, churches did help with, you know, securing Jews and saving people and stuff like that. But the Catholic church as a whole was like, I don't see I don't fascism. see anything. I don't know what's happening over there. <laughs> so Catholic moralism was like this very patriarchal, heteronormative, Everything was like, women do this, men do that, and you need to respect your husband. He's the leader, blah, blah, blah. Mm. And also, everything is black and white, right? Like, anything that is considered a sin is wrong, and they would, like, turn you into jail for it. Staunch, yeah. So, obviously, Lucia and America have to also be in hiding with their relationship. 
So this really puts a damper on basically Lucia's life. She They're, can't live. No. Their relationship is dangerous. She can't talk about her ideas. Imagine how depressing that would be. Yeah. Your whole life has to be kept under wraps. America was working for the Argentine consulate and Lucia worked as a photo editor for a magazine. And that was basically all they did. They just lie, like laid low, lived with her family, pretended to be roommates, I guess. I don't know. And for the rest of their lives together, they remained secretive, no longer ruffling the feathers of people around them for fear they might be arrested or worse. So they kept it secret the whole time for the rest of the time. Wow. And Lucia was very disillusioned by the fall of the anarchist and feminist movements in Europe because she had been so heavily invested in them and really believed that they would win mm -hmm. and they would bring about lasting and important monumental change. Mm -hmm. So to have that not actually come true was really devastating for her and she wrote a lot about that in her poetry of the time and her poetry really reflected her feelings of defeat hmm. so I know that feeling <laughs> lucia sanchez sarnil died in 1970 of cancer her tombstone read this pero es verdad que la esperanza ha muerto but is it true that hope has died hmm. but it's a question yeah so they're like, there's like Almost this like glimmer of challenge. hope, but is it true that hope has died? True. There's some, there's something slightly hopeful and optimistic about it, but knowing like how she spent the rest of her life basically in, in, in a prison of the mind. Yeah. Yeah. I, but like, I wanted to highlight her cause I was like, one, I'd never heard of her before. And two, mm -hmm. she, the pictures there's so many pictures and she's got like guns strapped on her and she's always like <laughs> looking like she's about to like kick somebody's ass. And even though, even though like when your movement doesn't go in the direction that you want it to go and in her lifetime, yes, yeah, she lost, but those little seeds of everything that she put in other women's minds, you don't know how many generations that influenced for other people. She made a difference. Oh, for sure. Yeah. And I think that her feeling so disillusioned by the end was a little misplaced. Like, yeah. I think that it would be very hard to have fought for a civil war and then had to flee from that civil war and then watch the rise of Nazi Germany and then <laughs> go back to Spain. And it's just like, yeah. you probably don't feel like a lot changed. But yeah. by 1970, shit had changed, you know, when she died. And, of course, she obviously died a little premature mm -hmm. in 1970. But I, I think that her life was worth highlighting. And I think her work really is impactful and probably was seen. I mean, that that essay that I was reading pieces from, that's all over the Internet. And, in fact, one of the sources that I used was a Facebook group called the Workers Solidarity Movement. Mm. And they spoke about her specifically and included the entire text of that article she wrote. So I also used the Anarchist Library, a blog of a woman named Caroline Angus Baker, and Wikipedia. That was a great, great story. Yeah, go Lucia. Go Lucia. How did I do yeah. on those pronunciations? You did fine. <laughs> her face. I cannot say muerto very well. I cannot roll my muerto. R. <laughs> I can't roll my R on Muerto. I can't. I tried it over and over and over again. R. <laughs> <laughs> Don't you dare. <laughs> okay. I trip up. I trip up on it too. My pronunciation isn't that great. Someday I'll get there. <laughs> All righty. Moving on. Yes, let's hear it. All righty. So my lady that I have for you today is Mary Anning. She's on my list. Is she? She's on my list. So I have looked her up probably half a dozen times. Couldn't tell you what she did. No, she's on my list, though. Fossil collector, a dealer, and one of the world's first paleontologists. So you wouldn't have remembered that. <laughs> I just remember reading her name on my list. <laughs> um, so Mary was born in Lyme Regis in Dorset, England in 1799. Oh, it's a long time ago. Very fucking long time ago. Her father, Richard, was a cabinet maker. And he was a miner. Uh, he worked in the coastal cliffside uh, fossil beds near the town. Her mother, Mary, was um, a homemaker and 
Mary's family was really poor, similar to Lucia. They struggled greatly. Uh, they lived in a really small little house right on the coast. Uh, one uh, documented piece was that storms used to hit their house all the time, like on that coastal region, mm. used to flood the house. Mm. Like if you could imagine, it's probably damp. Dark, little cold, not very homey. <laughs> yeah, um, not exactly like the place you want to grow up in. No. Uh, Mary's mother actually gave birth to 10 children, Woo-hoo-hoo. but only Mary and her brother Joseph made it to adulthood. Oh, wow. That's a lot That's of children a lot to lose. Of children lost. And I, I guess it wasn't that unusual for the time because around that time in the 19th century, uh, children dying before the age of five was pretty, like, you were lucky. If you got out of childhood. (sighs) That sucks. Yeah. So Mary's education was very limited. Uh, She had pretty much no access to schooling. Uh, She was able to attend a, this word always tripped me up. I was trying to say it. I practiced this word earlier. (laughs) Congregationalist Sunday school. (laughs) Oh. Where she learned to, she learned to read and write. So this uh, doctrine, Congregationalist doctrine, um, unlike the Church of England at the time, emphasized the importance of educating the poor. Oh, Uh, interesting. She had one prized possession, which was a bound volume of the Dissenters Theological Magazine and Review, in which Mm. there was an essay written by a man named Reverend James Wheaton, and he was urging the Dissenters to study the new and burgeoning science called geology. I feel like I, at some point in my college career, was forced to read that guy. Really? <laughs> I'm sure of it. <laughs> the name is way too familiar. Uh, in her hometown of Lyme Regis, uh, it had become a really popular seaside resort. There was an increasing number of wealthy and middle class tourists who wanted to go and tour the, the seaside cliff areas. <laughs> and a lot of the locals um, supplemented their income by selling curios to tourists, like little trinkets, little things. Yeah, and little things. A lot of the curios were fossils that had been found while mining and were pulled off the local sides, uh, cliff sides. Uh, fossil collecting was popular in the late 18th century and the early 19th century, but it was mostly a hobby. It was not... it. It was wasn't not, a science. It wasn't science, yeah. Oh, how funny. So gradually around Mary's lifetime, it was transforming into a science, and people were, were kind of realizing the importance of these fossils. So Mary's mother and father, um, they actually all as a family, the mother, the father, her brother, and her would go fossil hunting to all supplement the family's income. But they would sell the fossils? They would sell the fossils. Okay, so they were still, they were doing the curio thing? Yeah. So they offered their discoveries for sale to tourists and they had a table outside their home and they set up a little table outside the coach shop, which was near a local inn. Their family's financial uh, situation was pretty dire. Mm. Um, Her father was suffering from tuberculosis. Oh, shit. (laughs) And he was trying to recover from a severe injury he got. He fell off of a cliffside while, while digging for fossils and he hurt himself really bad. Yeah, I can imagine that didn't end well. Her father was also a dissenter, which is a person not of the Church of England. Mm. And dissenters at the time were legally banned from being hired from certain jobs, and mm. they were not allowed to join the military. So even like her dad, like trying to find a job, he can't. Hmm. And go, you know, do some time in the military, he can't. I didn't even know that. I didn't either. Uh, Mary's father ends up dying when she's 11 years old, and her family was left with his debt and no savings. Oh, shit. So they had their first kind of stroke of luck in 1811. Mary was 12 years old. Joseph dug up a four-foot ichthyosaur skull. And a few months later, Mary was like, I'm going to find the rest of that body. And she found the rest of the the entire (laughs) skeleton. (laughs) Yeah. What kind of dinosaur is that? So the ichthyosaur is like, it looks like a giant prehistoric crocodile. It's got a really long nose. Um, and kind of, uh, the legs look almost like how turtles legs look, oh. but like the fingers are all together, almost fin like it's really weird looking. <laughs> it's got a really like long nose and snout. So it looks kind of like a, a crocodile. They, uh, so Mary, yeah, she found the rest of the skeleton. And so as a whole piece, uh, this fossil n- nowadays is probably 200 to 175 million years old. Whoa. And a man paid the family 23 pounds for it, <laughs> <laughs> which at the time was 
a considerable was, amount of money. A considerable amount of money. You know, people still do that. People still fucking sell fossils instead of instead of instead like donating them, them, them to the, museums. Yeah, I just listened to an NPR story about like some random millionaire just paid like. Mm-hmm. Fucking millions of dollars so that he get he have his own skeleton privatizing in his house. history, <laughs> and and the Smithsonian really wanted the wanted the fossils, and they were this man was like, well, I'll pay more than the Smithsonian, and the <gasps> guy who found it was like, sure, I'd rather have the money. <sighs> Tragic. That shit's stupid. <laughs> Sorry. So the man who bought it was William Bullock, and he actually um, displayed it in London. While it was in display or on display in London, it sparked a considerable amount of interest because at the time, most people in England still believed in the biblical account of creation. <laughs> so, Sorry, I don't mean to <laughs> I know, creationists is- are crazy. No, those um, Which uh, creation basically implied at the time that the earth was still only a few thousand years old. Yeah. And it raised questions because people are like, this obviously isn't a thousand fucking years old. <laughs> it's obviously way older. Yeah. And so it it started some controversy. And there's this guy, uh, Lieutenant Colonel Thomas James Birch. Say that name five times fast. Yeah. He was a wealthy collector who bought uh, several specimens from the Annings. And he sees the family really suffering. And he sees their poverty. He sees them going out and doing this basically excavation and he yeah. feels bad. He's just like, he feels bad for purchasing all of that stuff from them. And he decides to hold an auction of all the fossils that he had purchased from them on their behalf. Oh, so okay. I'm I'd, like, I'm like a little, suspi- I have my skeptical <laughs> eye on. I'm like, are you though? Or are you just going to steal from them? <laughs> so this is a quote from Lieutenant Colonel Thomas James Birch. <laughs> For the benefit of the poor woman and her son and daughter at Lyme, who have in truth found almost all the fine things which have been submitted to scientific investigation, I may never again possess what I am about to part with. Yet, in doing it, I shall have the satisfaction of knowing that the money will be well applied. Okay. So he really was, like, honestly trying to help them. Yes. I was, like, worried that he was actually just a swindler. (laughs) So the auction was held at uh, Bullock's in London and raised 400 pounds for the family. Wow. Definitely put them in a more comfortable spot. Uh, This money helped them immensely, and it actually raised the family's profile within the geological community. So the family continued to excavate together and were still supporting themselves. And Joseph ended up taking up a apprenticeship as an upholster, like he wanted a career. Mm. And so now that the family had some money, he was able to go and apprentice. That was in 1825. So Mary assumed the leading role in the family business. She's 25 years old. So Mary's primary stock and trade consisted of the invertebrate fossils, such as ammonite, which I'm pretty familiar with. It's the one that looks like a little spirally seashell. Oh, okay. And the Bellamite shells, which were common in the area, and she could sell those for a few shillings each. Vertebrate fossils, such as ichthyosaur skeletons, sold for more, but were much rarer. And collecting them was really dangerous work. So I'm going to set up a scene of this is like how Mary does her job. Okay. So going excavating, it was done primarily in the wintertime. And it was because the freezing cold would create landslides of earth breaking open off the the cliff sides. So then more fossils would be exposed. And if they had like a giant windy storm, it would clear off all of these areas of rocks. And then she'd go down in there and look in there. That sounds real dangerous and cold. Super dangerous. And it's freezing. Uh, The land is also unstable because it's freshly cracked. It's not safe you know you're climbing up and you're going into the crags and things well if the land is sliding it's not stable yes you're gonna fucking die (laughs) there's it's windy there's ice there's snow she's digging for these herself and she's hauling them back and she's doing all of this in this giant wool dress (laughs) yes and it's like this big poofy sleeves and long with like a cloak on top of it looks like it weighs like 30 pounds and i'm like no it probably does. <laughs> she probably had arms for days. She had Michelle Obama arms. <laughs> Just, she had Obama. <laughs> uh, so one day when she was working, um, when she was excavating on the cliffside, a landslide ended up uh, 
killing her black and white terrier. Oh. And it was her little companion that she had when she would go out and it nearly killed her as well. Oh. This is a quote from from her. Perhaps you will laugh when I say that the death of my old faithful dog has quite upset me. The cliff that fell upon him and killed him in a moment before my eyes and close to my feet, it was but a moment between me and the same fate. So she kind of got a scare. She was like, this is... Yeah, and she lost her and dog. And she lost her friend. Oh, yeah. my God. Ugh, I, I've been crying about my dog all weekend. Oh, don't cry right now. <laughs> I'm not going to, but it does make me really, like, feel for her. Yeah. I'm, I mean... I when I read that too, I was like, "There's a painting of her and her dog too, which is I will include on our social media." It sounded like they spent a lot of time together. Yeah, her. Oh, and the dog's name was Trey. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> her reputation grew in 1823 when she found the first complete plesiosaurus skeleton, which had never been seen before. In 1828, she found the first ever example. Of a flying reptile, the pterosaur. Which, Ooh! Yeah, pterodactyls are rad. <laughs> yeah, they're my favorite. And Thanks, she... Jurassic Park. <laughs> <laughs> and that discovery was also followed by finding a squaloraja fish skeleton in 1829. And these skeletons are ranging in all different sizes. Some are massive, some are smaller. And man, things used to look weird back in the day. <laughs> wow, no kidding. I mean, I love dinosaur I shit. I do too. <laughs> dinosaur shit's cool. It just is. So Mary got her hands on as much uh, scientific literature as possible. She began to teach herself how to classify fossils. Oh, she, I love her. <laughs> <laughs> she took impressions of them because she she wanted to share them, but she didn't quite want to give them mm, yeah so she's like oh okay so she I'll took some in. Impressions. she made impressions and she would send them off to other people so she was also sharing her scientific findings that's so smart very smart so smart because <laughs> somebody might you might be looking at one thing for years and not notice that this guy over here or this lady is like yeah. oh look at this you know that was she sending them off to like institutions like educational yeah, she institutions was sending them off to other geologists so smart so smart So by her late 30s, she saved enough money to buy a home with a glass storefront, and she set up a shop called Anning's Fossil Depot. There she sold and displayed fossils, and many geologists and archaeologists, archaeologists, (laughs) (laughs) Uh, so many geologists and archaeologists from Europe and America would visit her shop. Mary's findings and theories were not always well received. Hmm. Many men would contradict her. Oh, they man's would funny. point out mistakes in her research. <laughs> oh God. <laughs> and some even doubted that she went out and labored to find the fossils at all. They're like, someone else probably did it. Yeah. But who? Who, bitch? Who? <laughs> Who's doing it for her? And also because Mary was a woman, uh, she applied but was denied acceptance into the newly found uh, Geological Society of London. Mm. And she wasn't even allowed to attend meetings as a guest. Fuck. Yeah. I hate it. I hate the patriarchy. <laughs> Down with the patriarchy. E- also, eat the rich. <laughs> <laughs> Fuck fascists as well. Yeah. <laughs> so Mary actually knew more about fossils and geology than many of the buyers that she was selling to. Of course she did. But the buyers were the ones who published the scientific descriptions and they took the credit and would leave her name out. Yeah, so they're like, this is this dinosaur, and blah, 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 and this is where it was found, but not that she discovered it. (laughs) I am furious. (laughs) So this didn't stop Mary. So she continued to excavate. She documented her findings. She began studying fish and reptile anatomy to further understand what she was finding. She's like, I'm just going to keep fucking learning. (laughs) did. Of course she did. Um, She did uh, field work with visiting geologists who actually came because they wanted to learn from her and with her. Yeah, they wanted to see where she was getting this shit. She actually, this is a fun story. She solved a mystery surrounding what they were calling at the time Bezor stones. And they were always found kind of around or inside other fossils. And they're like, what are these stones? These stones are always kind of around Hmm. the fossils. And so she actually took the stone, she dissected it, and she found inside were bones, fish scales, and smaller creatures. So oh. she realized it was actually fossilized feces. Oh, yes. So it was like another creature had eaten those things, yes. pooped, and then, it, and then the poop fossilized. Yes. 
Whoa. And what's significant about that is because Mary discovered that the feces contained samples of the prehistoric ecosystem. No shit. Like plants, other animals. Yeah. And also like <laughs> habits and yes. where things were located. Yes. Yeah, studying poop is like the number one thing you do when you study animals. I like how they were like, oh, what are these rocks? And then she's like, well, let's take a look, dipshits. So in 1835, she has a severe financial setback. And she lost most of her life savings in a bad investment. Uh Uh-oh. So one of her friends ends up persuading the British Association for the Advancement of Science and actually the British government, too, to award her with a pension because yeah. of her contributions to science. And so she ended up getting an annual pension of 25 pounds. And I mean, I know it's not a, a lot, year, but Ugh. she still was able to have just a little something. And in 1847, Mary was diagnosed with breast cancer. Mm. Upon learning of her cancer diagnosis, the Geological Society decided to raise money from its members to help with her expenses. And the council, um, the new the new council that was created in Dorset, it was a museum. They made her an honorary member, which is I like the nod, you know. Yeah, I wish. Oh, they an honorary member though. <laughs> I know. No, she I was should like, just be why a can't full she just member. Be a member. <laughs> she should be a full fucking member. You dickwads. Yeah. So she died. also first go fund me. <laughs> <laughs> True story. Oh, she died that same year. She was only forty eight years old. Uh, she was buried in the churchyard at St. Michael's local parish church. Uh, Members of the Geological Society donated a stained glass window in her memory, Mm. and it was unveiled in 1850. It's a really beautiful window. It's actually panels of windows. And after her death, Henry de la Beche, the president of the Geological Society, wrote a eulogy that he read at the meeting of the society and published it in its quarterly transactions. This mm-hmm. was the first eulogy given for a woman by the society. Charles Dickens. Ooh, I know him. <laughs> wrote an article about her life in February of 1865 in his literary magazine called All the Year Round. He emphasized the difficulty she overcame, especially the skepticism from her peers. He ended the article with, the carpenter's daughter has won a name for herself and has deserved to win it, which I thought was really cool. Yeah, I like that he said that she always had deserved it. Mm-hmm. Mary's discoveries became key pieces of evidence for the proof that extinction exists. <laughs> Her discoveries pr- provided important support for another controversial suggestion that was being presented by a geologist named George Cuvier that there had once been an age of reptiles. <laughs> Fucking dinosaurs, yo. <laughs> they were real. Yeah. So the Natural History Museum in London holds the largest collection of her discoveries. And she actually has an entire section of the museum dedicated to her. Uh, I want to go now. I know. In 1999, on the 200th anniversary of her birth, an international meeting of historians, uh, paleontologists, fossil collectors, all came together celebrating her life in her hometown of Lyme Regis. Oh, that's really cool. Mary's discoveries, uh, style of categorizing, and field practices were the very base of what paleontology is today. Hmm. And her contribution to science is like fucking immeasurable. Like it's just, she helped start this. The entire science division. Yeah. Um, And I put a little note on the bottom. uh, The Geological Society of London began admitting women in 1904. (laughs) So I was like, when did, when did they start? I know 50 years after she died. 1904. 1904. That seems late. Too late. Yeah. (laughs) A little 20th century. Mm-hmm. Is late. Yeah. So I got my information from berkeley.edu, from historyextra.com, and from Wikipedia. Nice job. I'm glad we ended with yours. Mine was a little depressing at the end. <laughs> <laughs> but both of our ladies died of cancer, and they were both kind around of, in the 1800s. Yeah, it's true. They had some overlapping time. They did. Well, nice job. Thank you. I was really, and I was a huge dinosaur nerd as a kid. I still love them. I was kind of like, I, I was like, uh, I don't even know what you call that, like a poser. <laughs> I thought they were cool, but I didn't want to like learn. <laughs> I wanted to just watch Jurassic Park and The Land Before Time. <laughs> One more time. So, yeah, I mean, but I had this friend who was obsessed 
with dinosaurs. So she would always tell me things I did not care to know. <laughs> that's like my son. He's like, oh, that's not an iguanodon. That's a mariosaur. I'm like, okay, <laughs> fuck, I didn't know. <laughs> I, but I think that I think we still don't know anything. You know, we still have so much to learn when it comes to that. And like, I grew up in an area of Montana that is um, also well known for fossils. And it was when I was a kid that they unearthed like the first almost complete, I think it was Stegosaurus. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. And it was fairly close to where I grew up. So it was like a big fucking deal. Mm -hmm. Well, just the, the dinosaurs that she found or not the dinosaurs, but the, the fossils that she found. It's like, I can't, I can't believe like all of that used to be underwater, you know? I it's, it is, um, Hard to wrap your brain around. Mm -hmm. How exciting would that be to discover that stuff? Well, I'm sure that in a couple million years, everybody's going to discover what happened to us because we (laughs) didn't stop climate change. So, (laughs) yep. True story. We're all going to be fossils too. I hope they look at mine and they go, I think she did something important. (laughs) I can just tell from her bone structure. (laughs) On that note, folks. (laughs) On that note, I hope you have a really great weekend and upcoming week. Um, We want to thank our editor, Lucas McIntyre. Thank you, Lucas. And also Jennifer Finch of L7 for the use of our theme music, which is Shirley from their album Hungry for Stink, the L7 album. We hope you join us next week. All right, guys. Till next time. Goodbye. Goodbye.